I mean, it's obvious God has a special plan for my life. Why did my brothers do this to me? I only did what my father asked for. A dream has come true. I mean, it's not nice to be sold as a slave by your own brothers. But here, yeah, it's okay. I won't die in here. Because I did everything right. Didn't I learn my lessons when my brothers sold me a slave? Now I'm dying because of them. God, your thoughts and plans are so much higher than mine. Good to see you. Are you doing good? ICF Zurich International. Mm. I was very looking forward to preach tonight. Firstly, because I get to see you guys and you all look so handsome. Yeah, of course, Björn, oh, you know it. <laughs> but especially also because I just love the story of Joseph. I think this is one of the greatest stories of mankind. It surely is one of the greatest stories in the Old Testament. And I just love this story. And over the last five weeks, we've been on a journey with Joseph from his dream to destiny. And we have learned that on this journey, Joseph has to go through several tests. And when God is testing us, it's always to make us better. So we've seen over the last weeks that on the road to his destiny, Joseph had to go through some tests so that his heart becomes more golden. You know, gets ready, because it's always about our heart. God wants us to be ready so that when we step into our destiny, there's nothing in our heart that stands between us and God and hinders the plans that God wants to live throughout us. So it's been a great journey to see that Joseph went from dream in direction of his destiny. And if you've been here last Sunday... We've heard that now he arrived in his destiny. Now Joseph is number two in Egypt. He's the second in charge. He has got the delegated power of the Pharaoh. That means that at the end of the day, he is the man in Egypt. He's powerful. He has lots of influence. And um, he's the man. But, you know, when we, when we live with God, we know that this alone can't be Joseph's destiny. I mean, just to be powerful and influential, that's just one thing. I mean, it's not God's goal to make you beautiful, successful, powerful, and that's it. No, of course not. That's very one-dimensional. And I think God has always the bigger plans. And we realize that God's plans are always bigger than ourselves. So it was not... For Joseph to become influential, that was his destiny. His destiny was what would happen in this place of influence. And it's interesting, when we look at the story of Joseph, we see that Joseph's purpose to become second in charge in Egypt was to become a savior. He became a savior for many. And this makes the person of Joseph so significant in the Bible because Joseph is a type for Jesus. You know, oh, uh, Joseph, um, he, he was able to, to understand the dreams of the Pharaoh and you probably know this dream where with these seven cows, the fat cows and the, the lean cows. And so he understood that there was something coming up. And so during the seven fat years where uh, Egypt was producing a lot of fruit, uh, they stored the grain, and so that when the seven years of famine came, um, the people wouldn't die from starvation. And so we see, like, Joseph becomes a savior in this time. And through him, many, many people got saved. And you, you see the parallel. Jesus, he's not just giving out grain. He is the bread of life. And he was born in Bethlehem, which means the house of the bread. And so we see that Joseph is foreshadowing many years before Jesus what real salvation would be. Because Jesus, through him, the whole humanity 
get this present of, of, uh, of salvation. So we, lead, we, we read in Genesis uh, 41 what happened there. Um, it says there, when the famine had spread over the whole country, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe throughout Egypt, and all the world, all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe everywhere. All swell that ends well. Joseph arrived. He's in his destiny, he is the savior of the world through him. And because he passed the test, he arrived at this place. But it's interesting to note that even though Joseph is in this place of influence where God prepared him all this year, there's still one last test that he needs to pass. And I believe this is probably the most difficult test then that he had to, to uh, pass, it's the forgiveness test. Because you know, there were some stories in his life that uh, were not over. You know, the whole story with his brothers, his family, that had brought him to this place. It was still an open book. They still hadn't talked since then, and there was still something where God wanted Joseph to really come into his destiny, not just externally, but also internally. So now, of course, his brothers come to Egypt, unsuspecting anything, because they had the same problem like everyone else. They needed food. There was no food in Canaan like in the other places. Now, you have to picture this scene. And this makes this story so such a great story because, I mean, even Hollywood couldn't write that great story books, okay? We agree on that. Hollywood needs to, to borrow biblical stories to make great movies. Well, Genesis 42, verses 5 to 6. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain. For there was famine in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brother arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. Now you need to picture that. This was the exact picture that Joseph had a couple of years before when he was a teenager, his first dream, you remember, where he dreamt that his brothers and, and his family would bow down before him, and then he was a teenager and he just brought that out, and this whole thing brought the hatred of his brothers on him, and the whole story of the last 13 years happened exactly because of this theme, and now it happens before his eyes. It's crazy. And let, let, us, let us have a look at Joseph and see what this scenery is, is doing with him. Because this is major, what is happening in this verse. They didn't recognize me. Not one of them. And uh, all my brothers bowed before me. As in a dream. Many years ago, and now, they're all here. And I got the power to save them, or to punish them. All those years in the prison, they wanted me to send a death. Lord, I, I see the way. I see everything you did with and for me in those years, but should I forgive them now? Did they change? I don't know. We see Joseph Bachman is fighting with his thoughts. You know, and that's what I love about the Bible. You know, and we need to be careful not to idealize 
the people in the Bible. Sometimes we think it's all like half saints, you know, that they're all people, they're so out there that, you know, it has nothing to do with my life. But I love it to see that Joseph was human like you and me. And he was going through the same fights that we are going through. And that's why we can learn so much from these people because they have the same situations that we experience in our everyday life. So it's important that we understand what happened at this moment when Joseph saw his brothers for the first time. And I'm so happy that Joseph reacted the way that he did. And that he did not like this holy, oh, how great, let's stay together forever. I'm waited for this moment over the last 13 years. I forgive you all in advance forever. He's not doing this and I'm happy because it would cause me problems if this was the example. But let me take you to Genesis 42, verse 7, and we see here what happens at this first, um, this first sight of um, Joseph with his brothers. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. He spoke harshly. To them. You know, that's usually what we do when there's been wrong done to us. We, we, um, we take revenge. There's something in us that you can feel it in your guts. And you see that Joseph reacts like any other person probably. The first reaction was, Oof. I got the power now. I got the power! Where do you come from? He asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Oh, really? <laughs> Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. And now, then he remembered his dreams about them. You know, I've read from some theologians who take this sentence and say, you know, Joseph was there and then he remembered his dreams and thankfulness filled his heart. Because he felt like God has put me to this place and now is the moment. This is just one way of interpretation. I think that the other way that I prefer is that he's looking at his brothers and there's some kind of movie happening in his head, you know, like saying, my goodness, I can feel some bitterness inside and this is not funny. I think this is what happened in this first moment. He remembered his dreams about them, and probably not just his dreams, but all the 13 years that he was in the pit, that he was in prison, everything happening in one second. And said to them, you are spies. Woo -hoo. I can feel the power there, you know, like he's now there and they are down here. That's very funny when you're the little brother. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. And it's interesting that after that, he throws them for three days into prison. <laughs> he throws them into prison. It sounds like tit for tat, you know, it's like, I mean, eh, 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 eh. wait and see. And, you know, I think that when we look at the life of, of Joseph and also how the story unfolds over the next, next couple of chapters, we just realize that, you know, forgiveness is not an easy thing. And forgiveness usually needs some process, some time. It needs a decision first, and then you go some step, and, and, and then you get, you get courage to, to, to let go and to forgive. And I'm so happy to see that even Joseph, a type for Christ, he's the closest to Christ than anyone else in the Bible. But he has a problem when it comes to forgive his brothers. And, I mean, we must be honest, what his brothers did for, to him was terrible. I mean, he really experienced some terrible thing. Uh, but we see that, that forgiveness is really something that, um, that is difficult. And even in the New Testament... Peter and Jesus had a discussion about forgiveness. 
And so I love it to see that the Bible gives us some insight into a pastoral discussion between Peter and his rabbi Jesus, Rabbi Jesus. And we go into this verse in Matthew 18, verse 21, and we read there Peter asking Jesus, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? I don't know what Peter experienced, but what I know is that Peter was married. <laughs> Why do we know that? Because Jesus healed his mother-in-law in Luke 4, so he even had a mother-in-law. This makes the whole story a bit more credible that he had some questions about forgiveness. I have a problem. I have a nagging wife back home. I have a, a mother-in-law who is, I like her. So how many times do I need to forgive? And we know Peter, he was, he was always a smart guy. You know, he was like the theologians. He, he, was, he was the one who, who really, you know, he could challenge Jesus. And then he says, up to seven times. Such a great theological answer. You know, seven, the number of perfection in the Bible. Up to seven times. Maybe he thought about this verse in Genesis 4 with Cain and Abel. After Cain killed his brother, God said, you will be revenged up to seven times if you kill Cain. And so imagine Peter, he knew this passage, and Jesus also. He's saying, you know, God is revenging seven times. I'm forgiving seven times. Woohoo! I'm really generous. Now listen to the answer of Jesus. He says, no, I tell you, not seven times but 77 times, or in other translations, it's 70 times 7. That's the translation that you find at most places. So 70 times 7 is 490 times. Imagine. This is shocking. I mean, he thought 7. I mean, the same person, 7 times. It's hard. But 490? Man. This sounds like some impossible task. And, you know, I think what, what, what Jesus really was saying here, he was saying, you know, forgiveness is a lifestyle. Forgiveness is a lifestyle. And what, what Jesus knew is that especially the people who are the closest to you will hurt you the most. Your spouse, your friend, your parents... Your church, church is family, come on. That's why we hurt each other so much in church and, and we, we're bitter and we leave the church. Why? Because we're open to each other, we, we go through things and then someone hurts you and, and then you need to decide what to do. So when Jesus says, says seven times, 70 times, he doesn't take 490 just because it's a big number. You know that all the numbers have a special meaning in the Bible. So seven, I said it already, is the number of perfection. Seventy in the Bible is the number of completion. Seventy times seven until the perfect completion we need to forgive. What is the perfect, perfect completion? Is when Jesus is coming back. That's when everything will be said and done. Jesus is coming back. Until this day, forgiveness is needed. Because we're human, we hurt each other. And we need to learn how it is to live a life of forgiveness. You know, Jesus gave us a prayer, the Lord's Prayer, as a framework for a prayer. And not a prayer that you pray just once in your life. It's a framework for your daily prayer. Where God says, you know, Jesus said, if you don't really know what to pray, take this, this will help you. So if, if you don't know what to pray, at least pray this, and you have prayed over all the most important things. And so there's one verse in this Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 12, where it says, And forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. 
You see what happens there is that each time you forgive, you just remembered that God forgave you before. That's what happens when we forgive. We forgive because He has forgiven us. And we can't expect God to forgive us if we're not ready to forgive. I say it again. We can't expect God to forgive us if we're not ready to forgive our brother and forgive our sister. So forgiveness is a lifestyle. It's something that we need to do all the time. And especially when it comes to, um, to marriage. You know, Martin Luther said that marriage is God's school of character. I have a great quote. One year of marriage makes you more holy than ten years in monastery. <laughs> How great is this quote? <laughs> Can I hear an amen from married couples? <laughs> One year of marriage saves you from ten years of monastery. But it only happens if you stay in this school. If you stay in this school and you learn to forgive, your character will be shaped and you will grow and you will change and it will make you a better person. So I think to be married is a great learning ground. Now, you might be sitting here tonight and say, you know, I, I, I don't care about God, about, about this, you know, like if Jesus tells his... his, um, his uh, disciples, thank you to, to forgive them, that, that's good for them, but I'm, I'm not so into this God thing. Um, even then, you have good reasons to forgive. You know, from this stage, we usually say, um, it's not about you. And we talked about that at the beginning of this message, that uh, it was not about Jesus, that he was in charge in Egypt. It was not about him, ultimately. It was about what God was doing through him. So, of course, this is true. This life is not about us. It's bigger than us. But now, for the first time, take it. The next point is all about you. You can take it. It's yours. Why? Because there's medical reasons. There's good medical reason to live a life of forgiveness. You know that... Up to 80%, it's scientifically proven, it's always good to say it's scientifically proven because it sounds then it's right, but I read it in a good place, that it's scientifically proven today that up to 80% of sickness have psychosomatic origins. That means negative stress, negative stress has effects on your body, and the following systems are influenced by Chronic stress level provoked by bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, self-hatred. It's your heart, your immune system, your digestive system. These are things that you can feel it in your bones when you're unforgiven. When there's unforgiveness in your life, when there's bitterness in your life, it will rob your sleep. It will just, it will, it will make you sick. So even though it's, just putting apart all spiritual things, there's a good medical reason for you to forgive because it makes you healthy. It makes you healthy. And science clearly shows there's a connection between your emotions, thoughts, and your physical constitution. And that's something that we need to take into account when we're talking about forgiveness because that's really something that is helping you if you forgive. You know, each time we get hurt in life, it's like someone is throwing a stone at you. So maybe your mother, your father, your boss, your friend, your pastor, they have done you wrong. And as Joseph experienced, really, he, he, it was not his fault, like his brothers hated him. And so he went through all of this. And each time, it's, it's like there's a stone thrown before you. And the question is now, what happens with these stones? You see, it's interesting in the Bible, the, world, the word for uh, forgiveness is the Hebrew word naza. And naza means to lift up or to carry away. So to forgive... Biblically means carry away. 
Now, if we don't forgive, what are we then doing? It's like you're taking a backpack and, and you're packing all your hurts in the backpack, the things that you think, no, I can't forgive. Oh man, that was just too hard. And he doesn't deserve my forgiveness. And instead of letting this carry away, I carry it against these people. You know, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping that the other dies from it. That's exactly what happens with this backpack. So I'm not forgiving. I think, oh, I won't forgive that one. And I might not kill the one, but I kill him maybe with my words, or I kill him because I'm just not talking to him anymore. And he's just dead, out of my life. But what I don't realize often is that I carry these stones, this hurt, and this makes me sick. Instead of letting forgiveness carrying these things away, I carry these stones throughout my life and I can feel it. And I can feel like this heaviness. I can feel the hurt in my bones that is something that doesn't do me good. And the, cool, the, the, the strange thing is that I think that it hurts the other one. But it hurts me. But the good, the good news tonight is that you, you can do something about it. You can do something about it. You can do something about these stones in your backpack. You can do something about this backpack. You can bring them to the cross. You can bring these stones to the cross so that Jesus can carry them away and exchange them with something else. And in a couple of minutes, I will give you the possibility to do that tonight. And, you know, we experienced that during the whole day this morning. Hundreds of people came to the cross. And you see the stones that are already there. Each stone is a person who decided to forgive. And, you know, forgiveness is a one-way thing. It's not the same like reconciliation. Reconciliation needs both sides. But forgiveness, you can always forgive. Reconciliation is a, is, is a gift from God if it's happening. But my part is to forgive, is to let go. It's not to hold against, but it's to carry away so that I don't feel the hurt anymore. Forgiveness causes change in our life. And tonight, I have invited Stefan, Stefan will tell us a short testimony about his life and what he experienced with his father and what, how uh, forgiveness changed his life. Give a round of applause to Stefan. Hey, Stefan. Let's take a seat and tell us about your story with your father. Yes, and these are my two stones. I will explain you. I grew up in a Christian family, and I got to know Jesus Christ as my Savior when I was a child, and I had a happy childhood, although I had a bad relationship with my father because he was absent. As a businessman, he was traveling all over the world, and he wasn't there when I needed him. And in moments when I, this would be important that he would be with me, he wasn't there. And when he was at home, he went to his office to have his peace. And also I remember that he had um, outbursts, outbursts of rage. And this hurted me. And he also had a strong attitude of performance and high expectation. So this all caused to me um, um, just uh, unhealthy life patterns and I developed an, an, um, just um, um, hate toward, uh, hatred toward my father and also self-hatred. And this all caused depression in my life. And tell us what happened then on the way to uh, reconciliation with yes. your father. So, uh, when I was adult, I had a successful life, but I still felt that I have 
inner wounds from my childhood. And I studied psychology as a second profession, and I could analyze what happened in my childhood, but I couldn't get in a healing. 14 years ago, I married, I got, um, we, God gave us two wonderful sons, and I want to be a, a better father than my father was, but it happened, same thing as my father, I had also um, outburst of rage, and this hurted me uh, also. So what happened then? Um, Jesus took me to his heart, and I went to a school of um, inner healing and deliverance, and there I realized that I have this self-hatred, bitterness, and unforgiveness to my father. What happened? Uh, I had an encounter, an incredible encounter with Jesus. During night, he embraced me, and I could feel him physically and this was just overwhelming because I just felt the love and um, just the tenderness of Jesus I never experienced from my father. This moment was the turning point in my life and I could forgive my father. And then also the relationship to my father changed. And as you said, I... Um, not only uh, received or could forgive, but I received reconciliation. My father died three years ago, and in the last year, he suffered from dementia. It's a tragic illness, but one good thing, he could show good emotions, and we had a good time together. And two weeks before he died, I went to hospital and just he, embra uh, he embraced me and hugged me and didn't let me go. So this, is, this was the moment of reconciliation and since then I don't have any bad feelings against my father. So this was just a gift of forgiveness. This is amazing. Great story. And, and tell us shortly what happened then afterwards in your relationship with your Sons. Yes. Um, about um, one, and a half, one and a half year ago, I went to ICF counseling and I had another amazing encounter with Jesus. At this time, Jesus showed me which stones I have in my life. And uh, I just have two, but he showed me balls with chains uh, uh, along my, uh, around my necks, and I could see clearly um, what was written on it. And on one ball there was written hatred, and on the other one performance, the one that I had from childhood. What happened then? Um, exchange of cross. Jesus gave me, instead of hatred, he gave me love, and instead of performance, acceptance. And the balls, they just, uh, Jesus cut it, and they went to the deep sea, and just disappeared. And so, these are my two stones. And of course, this had um, an influence of my life, also my relationship to my sons changed, I got more relaxed in family, and also the relationship to God changed because I knew that I'm his beloved son and he rejoices over me and I don't have to perform anymore. And also, since that, I could much better hear the Holy Spirit because I just had this freedom. And I believe this, this whole process, and it's 
a process over here all um, started because I could forgive my father. Wow. Thank you, Stefan, for your story, for your openness to share this with us. I think it's so important uh, that we understand what Stefan said, that forgiveness is a process, as we saw it in the life of Joseph. But it's something that can change or turn your life around when you decide to let go, to not hold against, but to carry away so that at the cross this exchange can happen. And God tonight wants to make this exchange possible for you. And I want to finish with the last verse in Genesis 50, where we see right at the end of the Joseph story. So it took several years until this last time where Joseph spoke to his brothers after their father died. We, we, leave, we read there in verse 19, Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. So there's no harsh speaking anymore. Now he's speaking kindly. Why? Because forgiveness happened. And the good thing in this story is that not just forgiveness, but also reconciliation happened. And the 12 tribes of Israel, they stayed together because of this event of forgiveness leading to reconciliation. So tonight I want to make it practical because I think this is a topic where we really, or I really feel that God wants to do something in our midst. And this is what we are going to do. There are some stones at the back there on both sides. And these stones, as I said, symbolize things, people, situations in your life where you, you're holding on things, where you feel that there's, there's unforgiveness, there's bitterness, there's things that are still there. And where you... you, you you believe tonight you need to forgive. Maybe it also means that you need to forgive yourself. You know, there's something, things happen or we do things and, and, and we, we just, we can't forgive ourselves. But it's so important that we forgive. That we forgive others, that we forgive ourselves. So we want to take a couple of minutes where I would ask you to, to ask God through His Holy Spirit to speak to you. to listen to his voice your feelings maybe you can feel something in your heart in your body maybe it wants to make you cry or to make you sad or furious you know these are these emotions like Joseph who remembered his dreams I think the Holy Spirit wants to stir these things to bring them so that we can give them a name and then we take them and we bring them to the cross. And as Stefan said, what happens at the cross is, an, is this beautiful exchange where you lay down your stone, your hate, your, you know, all these things that hold you back. And God gives you something else instead. And I believe that God wants to do this tonight so let's take a couple of minutes you can close your eyes bow your heads and just take a couple of minutes in the presence of God listen to his voice and then then do it Jesus I thank you I thank you that you died on the cross for us that you opened through your forgiveness you opened the way so that we can forgive others and I pray for all these people tonight and we know life hurts and there's always things happening but it doesn't have to stay like this and I just pray that Holy Spirit you will show us areas in our lives events of people that happened where we're still holding on to things 
and that you give us the courage to bring them to the cross. Maybe tonight is just the first step of a process leading towards forgiveness, but we decide tonight, we don't want to keep that in our backpack. We want to bring them to the cross. Thank you for your presence, Holy Spirit, and that you are here and moving powerfully in our midst. So let's take a couple of moments just to, to listen to his voice. I will trust your sovereignty when there is no clarity because I can't sit forever in my disappointment and pain. I'm going to stand and I'm going to sing again, sing again, sing again. Fear loves to limit you. Fear loves to keep you where you are. Fear wants you to do what you have always done and never do anything else. Fear wants to shackle your potential and fear always wants to limit you. But every everlasting change starts with the Word of God. The Word of God has a power in it like nothing else. Jesus, I'm afraid. Jesus, let's do it. And there are moments when you are in a ladder, when you are facing an area where you're super afraid. Pray, grab, hold, face. And please, don't give up.